A movie up for sale at the Cannes Film Festival's market features a poster that shows Melania Trump carrying Donald Trump's served head. It's a real movie titled When Women Rule the World and it stars a Melania Trump lookalike who plays a character in the movie named Maria Putin, Har Har. The poster's tagline reads, Meet the First Lady of the Future with her heads of state. In one hand, Maria Putin carries what looks like a zombie head, in the other, she cradles President Trump's head complete with his Make America Great Again hat. Naturally, the leftist Hollywood reporter, THR, is thrilled over this and selling its Obama-loving soul to convince us an obvious piece of low-rent garbage is actually serious and important satire. Watch the trailer and then read THR's propagandist attempt to convince a buyer at Cannes to pick it up, THR tells us not to be fooled by the B-movie poster. Don't be fooled by the B-movie style poster. In an interview with THR, director Sheldon Silverstein says the film is a high-concept, sci-fi satire with socio-political themes that align with movements like Hash Me Too and Time's Up and contain storylines that comment on toxic masculinity. He describes a key plot point, Donald Trump gets in a fight with Putin over who has the biggest penis, and he pushes a button that starts World War III, it's kind of crazy. The film has a consciousness and has something to say about what's going on in the world, Silverstein notes. Like Griffin, Silverstein shares a disdain for the current commander-in-chief. He's a moron and doesn't care about the environment. It's all about money to him, he tells THR. It's a shame he got elected and, this movie, is a put-down on all of that. Silverstein is in can showing footage of the film and searching for distribution partners. Everybody seems to like it so far, he says of the 90-minute film. In the movie's favor are all the hot chicks in tight bikinis, except for the one who looks like a guy. Hey, I'm all for artistic freedom. It's totally fine with me if someone wants to make a movie featuring the president's severed head. But that's because I'm driven by principle, by the American ideal of free speech and artistic expression, as opposed to partisan politics. I not only want everyone to tell us what is on their minds, to be honest about what they believe. I want them to be free to do so without fear of any kind of social sanction, boycott, or blacklist. Let the free market decide. The problem, though, is that propaganda outlets like DHR disagree. You can bet your life that, all things being equal, if this movie featured the Obamas instead of the Trumps, THR and the rest of the leftist drags that cover the entertainment industry would be ignoring, blasting, blacklisting this filmmaker and his film before the hour was out. You see, what is very important satire when Trump's severed head is featured would suddenly become a dangerous and racist incitement to violence if it were Obama's severed head. Remember that poor bastard who made the innocence of Muslims? You remember, he was Obama's patsy for the September 11, 2012, Benghazi attack where four Americans were left to die, including our ambassador. Remember how Obama needed to blame anyone but himself and Hillary for the attack, so this poor guy was arrested in the middle of the night and sentenced to a year in prison. Here's how THR defended his artistic freedom. Oh, wait, THR never did. When the left does it, it's art, when the right does it, it's hate, bigotry, and violence. But to defend its championing of when women rule the world, THR spends a couple opening paragraphs praising comedian Kathy Griffin for publishing that photo two years ago where she also carried Trump's bloody and severed head. What she did, THR informs us was kickstart a politically charged dialogue that spread beyond the world of comedy that begged the question, how far is too far? Oh, my, yes, a vital how far is too far debate from the same Hollywood reporter that has said nothing in defense of those being buried alive during this fascist woke wave hitting Hollywood and the tech world. In today's culture, people on the political right are second-class citizens who do not enjoy the same rights as the beautiful people on the left. Leftists can say and do whatever they like, they can express themselves however they like, but if we do the same we're blacklisted, punished, deplatformed, blackballed, slapped with a scarlet letter. I wish the filmmaker behind When Women Rule the World all the luck in the world, but I despise and resent the Animal Farm Affirmative Action Program instituted by our news media, entertainment industry, tech lords, and academia that give him more rights than the rest of us. Pro-choice activists screamed vulgarities at a pro-life demonstrator at the Hash Stop Bans protest Tuesday on Capitol Hill. All right, pro-life Barbie, walk the fuck away. One of two pro-choice activists told Allison Howard Sandefant, director of strategic communications and live action, a pro-life organization. In the video captured by Breitbart News, 
The two women can be seen repeatedly berating Sinophant, shouting fuck you. Fuck you and the rest of you ignorant bitches. Planned Parenthood, Naral, the Women's March, and other left-wing groups are protesting across the country at some 400 demonstrations this week, holding what they call a day of action for abortion rights. Rep. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, DNY, declared on Sunday that the Green New Deal will reverse purported colonial attitudes associated with growing vegetables in community gardens. What I love too is growing plants that are culturally familiar to the community. It's so important, the 29-year-old freshman congresswoman said while filming herself strolling through a community garden in the Bronx. That's really how you do it right, the self-described democratic socialist continued in a follow-up video. That is such a core component of the Green New Deal is having all of these projects make sense in a cultural context, and it's an area that we get the most pushback on because people say, why do you need to do that? That's too hard. Ocasio-Cortez then said that growing cauliflower in community gardens represents a colonial approach, turning off people of color from embracing environmentalism. But when you really think about it, when someone says that it's too hard to do a green space that grows yucca instead of, I don't know, cauliflower or something, what you're doing is that you're taking a colonial approach to environmentalism, and that is why a lot of communities of color get resistant to certain environmentalist movements because they come with a colonial lens on them, she argued. Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Ed Markey, DMA, unveiled the Green New Deal in February, a plan to transform the U.S. economy with a 10-year national mobilization to shift away from fossil fuels and replace them with renewable energy sources. An outline and FAQ for the proposal detailed goals like replacing or upgrading every building in the country over 10 years, the eventual elimination of necessary air travel, and economic security to citizens unable or unwilling to work. Ocasio-Cortez has claimed that the FAQ, which was given to NPR and other media outlets, is separate from the Green New Deal's actual objectives. Several Democratic presidential candidates, including Senators Elizabeth Warren DMA, and Kamala Harris DCA, have expressed support for the Green New Deal. Campaigning in Iowa days after the plan was unveiled, Senator Cory Booker DNJ, another White House hopeful, compared it to fighting Nazis to World War II. We have to deal with this. Our planet is in peril, and we need to be bold. It's one of the reasons I signed on to the resolution. I co-sponsored the resolution for the Green New Deal, he said. There's a lot of people blowing back on the Green New Deal. They're going, oh, it's impractical, oh it's too expensive, oh it's all of this. If we used to govern our dreams that way, we would have never gone to the moon. Ocasio-Cortez's latest head-scratching remarks come after walking back her infamous prediction that the world will end in 12 years due to climate change. In a May 12 tweet, the progressive lawmaker suggested that Republicans too often fact-check her jokes, accusing them of taking her quips too literally. Why you'd have to have the social intelligence of a sea sponge to think it's literal, said of her January remark in which she said the world will end in 12 years if we do not solve global warming climate change. Islamic terrorists have carried out an estimated 76 attacks in nearly 15 countries since the beginning of Ramadan this month, killing at least 364 people and injuring 404 others in the first two weeks of the holiest month for Muslims, a Breitbart news tally shows. That means, on average, Jihad has killed at least 25 people and injured about another 30 each day since Ramadan began at sunset on May 5. This year, the holy period is expected to last through sundown on June 4. Breitbart News Count this week covers the 14 days of May 6 through May 19. The tally includes a total of 768 casualties, 364 deaths, 404 injuries, in 14 countries, Afghanistan, Benin, Burkina Faso, Chad, Egypt. Iraq, Pakistan, Kenya, Somalia, Libya, Mali, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Syria. Afghan Taliban narco jihadists surpassed their Islamic State, ISIS ISIL, rivals as the world's chief perpetrators of terrorist attacks during Ramadan this year, with 29 attacks that killed 146 and wounded 156. ISIS closely trailed the Afghan Taliban with 23 assaults that resulted in 105 fatalities and 132 injuries. The Taliban is responsible for 40% of all fatalities while ISIS was behind an estimated 30%. Overall, the Taliban carried out nearly 40%, 302, of all casualties, including injuries. Breitbart News found that, so far, 
Afghanistan, 160 deaths, 189 injuries, Nigeria, 50 deaths, 33 injuries, and Iraq, 46 deaths, 54 injuries, are the bloodiest countries during the holy month. Jihadis and other Islamists encourage their followers and supporters to escalate attacks during the holy month, arguing that Allah exceptionally rewards martyrdom during Ramadan. The Afghan Taliban rejected a Ramadan ceasefire offer by the Afghan government this month. Instead, Zabila Mujahid, a spokesman for the narco-jihadi group, proclaimed, as jihad is, the best part of worship, doing it on Ramadan is rewarded more than in other months. The vast majority of Ramadan attack victims are Muslims in Africa and the Middle East. Breitbart News primarily gleans its data for its Ramadan death tally from the Religion of Peace website, but it also relies upon other databases as well as media and government reports. Iran quadrupled its uranium enrichment production capacity amid tensions with the U.S. over Tehran's atomic program, nuclear officials said Monday, just after President Donald Trump and Iran's foreign minister traded threats and taunts on Twitter. Iranian officials made a point to stress that the uranium would be enriched only to the 3.67% limit set under the 2015 nuclear deal with world powers, making it usable for a power plant but far below what's needed for an atomic weapon. But by increasing production, Iran soon will exceed the stockpile limitations set by the accord. Tehran has set a July 7 deadline for Europe to set new terms for the deal, or it will enrich closer to weapons grade levels in a Middle East already on edge. The Trump administration has deployed bombers and an aircraft carrier to the region over still unspecified threats from Iran. Already this month, officials in the United Arab Emirates alleged that four oil tankers were sabotaged, Yemeni rebels allied with Iran launched a drone attack on an oil pipeline in Saudi Arabia, and U.S. diplomats relayed a warning that commercial airlines could be misidentified by Iran and attacked, something dismissed by Tehran. A rocket landed Sunday near the U.S. Embassy in the green zone of Iraq's capital of Baghdad, days after non-essential U.S. staff were ordered to evacuate from diplomatic posts in the country. No one was reported injured. Iraqi military spokesman Brigadier General Yair Azal told the Associated Press that the rocket was believed to have been fired from eastern Baghdad, an area home to Iran-backed Shiite militias. The Iranian enrichment announcement came after local journalists traveled to Nadins in central Iran, the country's underground enrichment facility. There, an unidentified nuclear scientist gave a statement with a surgical cap and a mask covering most of his face. No one explained his choice of outfit although Israel is suspected of targeting Iranian nuclear scientists. The state runner in a news agency later quoted Bahruz Kamalvandi, the spokesman of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, as acknowledging that capacity had been quadrupled. He said Iran took this step because the U.S. had ended a program allowing it to exchange enriched uranium to Russia for unprocessed yellow cake uranium, as well as ending the sale of heavy water to Oman. Heavy water helps cool reactors producing plutonium that can be used in nuclear weapons. Kamal Vandi said Iran had informed the International Atomic Energy Agency of the development. The Vienna-based UN nuclear watchdog did not respond to a request for comment. Tehran long has insisted it does not seek nuclear weapons, though the West fears its program could allow it to build them. Before Iran's announcement, Trump tweeted, If Iran wants to fight, that will be the official end of Iran never threaten the United States again. Trump's remarks reflect what has been a strategy of alternating tough talk with more conciliatory statements he says is aimed at keeping Iran guessing at the administration's intentions. He also has said he hopes Iran calls him and engages in negotiations. He described his approach in a speech Friday, saying, it's probably a good thing because they're saying, man, I don't know where these people are coming from, right? But while Trump's approach of flattery and threats has become a hallmark of his foreign policy, the risks have only grown in dealing with Iran, where mistrust between Tehran and Washington stretch for decades. While both sides say they don't seek war, many worry any miscalculation could spiral out of control. Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif soon responded by tweeting that Trump had been goaded into genocidal taunts. Zarif referenced both Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan as two historical leaders that Persia outlasted. Iranians have stood tall for a millennia while aggressors all gone, he wrote. Try our respect, it works. Zarif also used the hashtag hash never threaten an Iranian, a reference to a comment he made during intense negotiations for the 2015 nuclear accord. Trump campaigned on pulling the U.S. from the deal, 
which saw Iran agree to limit its enrichment of uranium in exchange for the lifting of economic sanctions. Since Trump withdrew America a year ago from the pact, the U.S. has reimposed previous sanctions and come up with new ones, as well as warning other nations they would be subject to sanctions as well if they import Iranian oil. British Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt told journalists in Geneva that Iran should not doubt the U.S. resolve, warning that if American interests are attacked, they will retaliate. We want the situation to de-escalate because this is a part of the world where things can get triggered accidentally, Hunt said. Meanwhile, Oman's Minister of State for Foreign Affairs made a previously unannounced visit Monday to Tehran, seeing Zarif, the state runner in a news agency said. The visit by Yusuf bin Alawi comes after U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called Oman's Sultan Qaboos bin said last week. Oman long has served as a Western back channel to Tehran and the Sultanate hosted the secret talks between the U.S. and Iran that laid the groundwork for the nuclear deal negotiations. In Saudi Arabia, the kingdom's military intercepted two missiles fired by the Iranian allied Houthi rebels in neighboring Yemen. The missiles were intercepted over the city of Taif and the Red Sea port city of Jeddah, the Saudi-owned satellite channel Al Arabiya reported, citing witnesses. The Saudi embassy in Washington later confirmed the interceptions. Hundreds of rockets, mortar rounds and ballistic missiles have been fired into the kingdom by the rebels since a Saudi-led coalition declared war on the Houthis in March 2015 to support Yemen's internationally recognized government. The Houthi Sal Masira satellite news channel denied the rebels had any involvement with this round of rocket fire. Between the two targeted cities is Mecca, home to the cube-shaped Kaaba toward which Muslims pray. Many pilgrims are in the holy city for Ramadan. Early Tuesday, Saudi Arabia said the Houthis targeted civilian infrastructure in the kingdom's border city of Najran, without elaborating. The Houthis did not immediately acknowledge such an attack.